Uh, we need an intro. We got an intro. Yeah. Okay. Maybe. Okay. We just did three Hold intros. On. Welcome to episode 48 of Gorilla Radio Show, Maya Monkey Man. Today we have a special guest on, our friend Jax, who probably should introduce himself as an expert in uh, in this particular field we'll be talking about today. And we'll, but yeah, Jax, why don't yeah, you Jax, why don't you go ahead and introduce, introduce. Just shut up. Just. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so. Hi, I'm Jax. Uh, I don't really know what to say other than I am, I'm a graduate student at Northwestern University in the Department of Anthropology. Um, I am an anthropological archaeologist, and uh, I specifically work in the southern Mexico region of the Maya area in Chiapas. And I have a, a very niche specialization of looking at Maya water management. I don't really know how really to describe that without using too many jargony words. Use jargon I look words. At, it's okay. jargon. Yeah, we'll break it down okay. later. We love yeah. jargon. The more jargon, the more impressive it is. <laughs> this is right. the rule of thumb. <laughs> yeah. I study Maya water management uh, in Chiapas. My research looks at how uh, the pre-classic Maya, so um, about BC 2000 to 250 AD, Maya created and managed water structures and natural resources kind of all within a, a Maya worldview and a Maya cosmology. I look mostly at structures called aguadas, which are really similar in form and function to like an American like suburban retention pond. Um, and they're also similar to, to reservoirs and things like canals and, and reservoirs. I use things like spatial analysis and like LIDAR data. So like light detection and ranging, you know, flying a drone over the jungle so you can see the landscape and geology and indigenous knowledge systems, um, which I guess really broadly and kind of also avoiding the use of, of really big academic words kind of refers to particular indigenous ways of knowing and being and learning and teaching and all these things kind of situated within culture and space. Um, and I do all that to look at, at water. Nice. Yeah. Very, very awesome. cool. So what, what, we before we get into <laughs> all the big questions, more about you, what got you into hydrology in, in terms of this as something you should focus on in anthropology? That's a good question. I don't know. It's kind of where all of my um, undergraduate research that I did kind of ended up leaning towards. Mm -hmm. um, when I was, I was lucky enough to get um, kind of recruited into uh, a project, a project that I still work for now, the the Metzobuk Archaeological Project. And I, at first, as an undergrad, uh, did some research studies looking at cenotes, which are, are um, I guess, they're kind of they're, they're sunken caves karstic or, or soluble limestone caves um, that are really common in that part of uh, Mexico and Central America. And they're really important um, in a lot of different ways, ecologically, geologically, and culturally. And I was looking at those sort of kind of, I don't know, I was an undergrad, so it wasn't too nuanced or anything like that, but I was looking at that and it got me interested in, in the role of water. And for my graduate school application, I kind of switched from looking at cenotes to looking at, at more intentional created water landscapes. So, but that, you know, the farther I'm getting into my dissertation proposal and everything, it's, there's a fine line. It's, there, there really isn't too much of a distinction between what's created and what's natural um, for water features in the Maya world. And where I work in, in Southern Mexico, uh, I work in the Northeastern part of the state of Chiapas in the La Condon jungle. And it's, it's, Got a lot going on. So it was uh, a really interesting opportunity to start looking at all of that. That's really interesting. Have you ever seen a monkey in the wild, like in person? I have. Um, I've seen a howler monkey. I've seen howler monkeys, multiple. Um, mostly you hear them. They're, <laughs> yeah. they're really common um, in the Lacandon jungle and specifically where I work. When I do field work, we sleep outside and... Yeah, like you fall asleep to the sound of howler monkeys in the distance. It's really awesome. And then I also... Is it, would you say it's soothing or is it like scary? Or do you get used to it? I <laughs> am weird. So to me, it's soothing. <laughs> um, I feel like to other people, like they really do, they sound like monsters. 
Um, <laughs> they are extremely monstrous. The noises that come out of their mouths is terrifying, I guess. <laughs> to me, I think that like it lulls me to sleep like a lullaby, but I think they're great. And I met one like in person for the other outside of seeing them in the trees. So I've been to um nearby there's a really big, um, pretty famous, I guess, contextually, archaeological site called Palenque, and that's kind of our place where we go to the grocery store <laughs> before we go into the jungle and um i've been to that site a few times and you can see like the howler monkeys like going between the trees and everything um i don't think i've ever i don't think i've ever seen them where i work specifically but i've seen them dis in the distance and heard them a lot but i met one for the first time like in person uh when i did field work in the summer in june i stayed at a hotel in palenque that I didn't realize when I was booking the hotel was also um, a howler monkey sanctuary, which is oh very my cool. god, <laughs> yeah. So, um, awesome, they uh, rescue and rehab howler monkeys that have been kind of displaced by um, logging and uh, kind of like the illegal trade and everything like that. And yeah, I met a monkey named Bolillo, like the like the bread roll, he was very cool. Oh. Yeah, nice. like cool. I was nice. eating breakfast and he was just kind of like, chill guy? <laughs> he was pretty cool. He just dropped in, ate a banana, pet a dog and dipped. It was great. You know, sorry, <laughs> sorry to throw us off topic for a second, but Austin, have you ever seen a monkey in the wild? <laughs> I've never thought to ask you this question. Uh, I don't think, yeah, you know, never... actually, technically not. No, because all of my experiences so embarrassing for you. but I mean, I'm, I'm <laughs> it is so embarrassing for me. I'm like, I've seen more fraud. monkeys in the wild than you have. <laughs> I look. I just got my passport, and I am still planning on going to Thailand this summer. So I, you know, get seeing monkeys in the wild soon. Hopefully, I'll if you ever go to Chiapas, you're like guaranteed to see at least a howler monkey. Yeah. I've actually never seen. Um, what's the other guy? Spider monkey. Never yeah, seen one of them. Yeah. Um, howler monkeys though are everywhere. Awesome. I have I have like yeah. a stupid question about Palenque for you, because in my mind, like They'll I know what it. Palenque is. <laughs> Was there already like a, a modern town there before it became this big archaeological site, or did that pop up because of the tourism and the archaeology work going on there? It was kind of for Palenque specifically, as far as I know, um, it kind of happened simultaneously. Okay. So it was one of the the places in Chiapas that was already pretty well known for having the you know the big like ornate monumental temples, and so the little town nearby kind of came up alongside the tourism, which was starting pretty early okay. for the area. But don't quote me on that. I'm that's pretty okay. sure that's the what it is. But <laughs> your word is better than mine in this situation, so I believe you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> We'll believe anything you say. We don't. We don't even have to fact check it. We can just. Okay. <laughs> um, Austin, why don't you guide us through some topics before the multitude of questions that are shattering around in my mind like take over, and that's what the whole. Yeah, episode. Greg has so many questions. Greg is Lots of questions. huge nerd. Mm -hmm. um, so um, yeah, I guess as you mentioned, spider monkeys and howler monkeys are kind of like the big main monkeys that you're probably going to see if you go there, or maybe not spider monkeys, but uh. And this sort of has uh, mm -hmm. relevance because, you know, obviously the ancient Maya knew of the monkeys. They existed alongside them, as, you know, everyone does today. Uh, and there's quite a few carvings and artworks depicting them. And I believe it's also sort of a part of their uh, religion at some points. Um, but there, there's like a whole bunch of examples of this. So the first example I wrote down here was there was a 1700 year old uh, spider monkey remains discovered that was thought to be a gift like diplomacy it was interesting uh yeah and full disclosure i know nothing about teotihuacan outside of the yeah. fact that they did trade and have interaction with the maya which is what that article was about um yeah the teotihuacan uh it was sort of like a gift of diplomacy but that sort of like implies sort of a pet primates right like uh mm -hmm. There were, we do have um, kind of both recorded um, evidence of and um, archaeological evidence and oral history of some contemporary Maya peoples that monkeys were, they were important culturally. They were also sometimes yeah. used as a food source and there, there's historical evidence of them at a certain period of time in, in kind of like the Chiapas Tabasco area were, were hunted um, for subsistence. And then um, they were also kept as pets sometimes so yeah so they really, contain multitudes <laughs> they, they have a lot of stuff going on with them i'm seeing here uh there's 
images of monkeys carved into stone and bone, painted on ceramic vessels, bowls, plates, and vases that were in uh, funerary contexts. And in creation myths as well, uh, I believe the idea is that monkeys were an early and failed attempt by the gods to produce humans. Um, yes. Yeah, so, so I I understand where the <laughs> where the preconception could come from. <laughs> it's the story is really fun. So there is a um there is multiple Maya like contemporary Maya creation books. The biggest most well known one is the Popol Vuh, which is from the Quiche Maya. And mm -hmm. depending on the translation that you read, um, there's some differences. But yeah, the the main role of monkeys in the Popol Vuh is pretty fun. So the first big one is, yeah, that they were they were kind of a, a proto-human situation. So when uh, Plumed Serpent um, and, let's see the guy, Artist Guy uh, is their name in the book, um, created humanity, where they were trying to create people. They first made people out of mud, didn't work because they were made of mud. Um, next, they tried wood, made people out of wood, uh, and it also wasn't going too well. And then I'm not super well versed in the Popol Vuh. I read it a few times. Mostly my focus is on water, though. So um, they were destroyed, and the the remaining um, wood people became monkeys. And um, yeah, <laughs> there's a very there's a very interesting passage in it where they just kind of describe all of the ways that they destroyed the wood people um, to make way for the for the next attempt at creating people. Um, which I believe was humans. I think they were the third. Don't quote me on that. Um, and the gouger of eyes comes in to play and all oh sorts God. of very cool figures who come in and, and try to wipe out the, the wood people in order to create humanity. And then we have monkeys now as oh, a result. Huh. The other big role of monkeys in the Popol Vuh specifically is they appear as um, the hero twins, Ishpalanka and Hunapu, are um you know the the main kind of figures in the Popol Vuh and they have like what's basically the wicked older brothers um like wicked older stepbrothers and um <laughs> they get turned into monkeys so it's it's uh what is their name it's one monkey and one artisan in English in Maya um their name is Hun Bats and Hun Chuen I think is how you say it. yeah and I, that's what I had in my little notes when I was skimming about this stuff it's yeah. yeah they were basically assholes and they um the hero twins were like okay well um we gotta like figure out what to do about these guys and they kind of defeat them by turning them into monkeys. they can they trick them into turning themselves into monkeys in a way um they make them climb up a tree um and then use their loincloths in order to try to get down and it turns into ta in one translation it turns into no i think in both they turn into tails and then they become monkeys in one translation of the Popol Vuh, they turned into spider monkeys. They specify spider monkeys, but in another, it just says they turned into monkeys and they howl from the trees. So I guess whether they turned into howler monkeys or spider monkeys is up to you. Um, uh huh. In yeah. What do you Yuc say? It's like, oh, sorry, no, continue. Oh, I was just going to say, in Yucatec, Mayan bots is the name of a howler monkey. Like, that's the word that's used now. Um, but language changes over time, so that's not exactly definitive. Yeah. So would you say it's like mostly like a negative view, uh, at least from a religious standpoint? <laughs> I think that that's one of those things, I guess, from from kind of an indigenous knowledge systems perspective, isn't necessarily negative or positive. It kind of, you know, not to be like it contains multitudes, but it does uh, um, because yeah, no, that, yeah. the brothers, the older brothers were kind of described as being good at everything they did, which is why, you know, them like because they were scholars and writers and artisans and artists, they um, succeeded in all of these different things. And that's strongly why, like, there's this association between monkeys and, and being an artisan or a scholar. So, yeah, and also, no, I guess there's still this kind of idea that, that monkeys are almost a result of divine punishment by the gods for not successfully being people. Um, and in different contemporary Maya, like oral histories, you'll find kind of different interpretations. I know in, because I work with the Lacandon Maya, and from what I've read of kind of how monkeys play, they play a role in their origin story very similarly, but there is that that concept of the divine, the divine punishment, and then now you're a monkey. 
Uh huh. That's fascinating. Uh, would that be why um, the artisan twins specifically? Is that why they are typically in artwork in a funerary context? Is it maybe to commemorate people who were artisans as well, or is that just sort of speculative? <laughs> I think a little bit of both. In my like researching, just to make sure I wasn't talking out of my ass, I figured out that that's a big argument people have is whether or not like does does this theory explain why they're found in funerary contexts and this and that. And I'm like, oh, I don't study monkey iconography, so this is above <laughs> my pay grade. But uh, yeah, the, uh, largely when you see these really beautiful like ceramic um, like vases and um, paintings and things like that that have that feature monkeys. They're usually largely, you know, they'll, they'll be illustrations of stories. So that would include like stories from the Popol Vuh um, and also just illustrating things that happening, like events like that were happening, um, important figures in history and just the natural world around them. So that's why kind of depending on the context of the the artifact will also kind of depend on whether the interpretation is that it's like, for example, a howler monkey or a spider monkey. So like in Chiapas, in the part of Chiapas I work in, if I see something like that, it's like, it's probably a, a howler monkey. And in other parts of the area, like along the river, maybe it'd be a spider monkey. There's like the curled tail would indicate like a spider monkey, but beyond like specific things like that, um, place and sp like specifically where you are would play a big role in, in who gets featured. There's deer too and dogs yeah. and stuff like so, that. <clears throat> I guess a question I have to follow up on that is, yeah. is, is the fact that the story kind of is very geographically important just to what you're kind of getting out of it, is that more like a, a consequence of just the Maya never being really a single unified polity? So there is no overarching, like, we do we have an idea of where the original is, like what the original should have been? Would that be something that, like, the Popol Vuh is the original and everybody else has their own take on it over time. How does how does that work? I guess in your that's mind? a good question. Well, the Popol Vuh is a historic piece of of writing, um, more or less, because the Kiche are a, are a contemporary indigenous people, mm -hmm. um, and there's also the um, Chilambalam of Chumayel is another book that was written like for the Yucatec Maya broadly, and um, there's others. So. A lot of them are really similar, and a lot of them will vary in different ways, and a lot of those ways are regional or cultural. Um, as far as, yeah, I mean, the, the Maya, as far as I know, and as far as we know, generally, were kind of the identity and, and culture were dependent on, like, polity and region and things like that, despite having lots of cultural things shared, and then lots of trade um, and interaction happening. Um, yeah. That's my best answer. Other than that, you're getting into like dissertation topics. Yeah, right? yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> huh. This is all very fascinating. Uh, I guess one of my notes that is, uh, I wrote down here that howler monkeys are generally shown as more serious and responsible, where spider monkeys are shown as more silly and mischievous. Uh, I'm not sure if that is also geographically dependent, but is that like true in your view or is it just geographically? I mean, from having met a howler monkey, that tracks. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> For sure, though. He was a very serious looking dude. Yeah. I Yeah, I think also a lot of this is just like, for example, like it says here, they're depicted engaging in lewd or indecent behavior. It's like, yeah, I, I believe that. Like, that's just what monkeys do. I, I, I think that's just like a consequence of them observing the world around them. Yeah. That's also, yeah, that sounds like spider monkey behavior. I think yeah, that those spider guys monkeys, are more common yeah. in like Guatemala. I think I I don't work in Guatemala. I've been there once on a technicality, but um, I'm pretty sure <laughs> that um, I read somewhere that spider monkeys play a bigger role in parts of Guatemala. Again, don't quote me on that. I, I feel sure. like that's accurate because um, they'll come into from it. what the reading I've done. They're more right. sociable. I'd like the picture of spider monkeys exist more in Guatemala and in Chiapas. It's all howler monkeys. I the one time I did see spider monkeys once I was along the Usumacinta River, which is again like the division between Chiapas and Guatemala. Um, and I'm also not like a monkey expert or monkey behavior Neither expert. Neither am I, man. Um, it's okay. I it. <laughs> Spider monkeys sound like they're more personable. Um, but yeah, those are the two main... I was reading... 
because I got curious. I was like, wait a minute, are there other monkeys uh, in this area other than in the Maya area, other than just howler monkeys and spider monkeys? And the answer is uh, yes and no. Um, there's two species of howler monkey and one species of spider monkey. And then people argue about whether capuchins were ever around, but if they were, they aren't anymore. Yeah, I, I'll just say like anecdotally, this like tracked for me because my only experience with spider monkeys was I used to work at this uh, little kind of garbage little zoo. Um, wasn't really it wasn't like AZA certified. It was my first job in like the primate husbandry realm. I guess it was during the pandemic as well. Um, basically, they they took in a lot of like pet primates from like rural North Carolina that people realized I can't take care of this entire monkey. Oh my god, um, that's so specific. How many people in the world? Yeah. Never mind. Too many, I <laughs> guess. I don't know what the hell is going it's, on. Uh, it's, <laughs> a, it's a pretty decent number. Someone had an olive baboon, which is like almost Great Dane size, depending on like oh how god. big they end up. A lot up. of space um, out in the mountains out, out here, you know? You can get lost <laughs> Yeah, there. like, uh, and one of, the, one of the stories of one of the monkeys that ended up there was they found it like chained up on like a dog leash to a tree which is insane because yeah. it's okay. like i get did they think it was just like a like it wouldn't climb the tree <laughs> or something i don't know but um so we had a spider monkey exhibit with like multiple spider monkeys i don't remember how many like maybe even like six or so i i think also part of the problem here slightly was that um they weren't good at like giving like birth control to the monkeys to stop them from breeding once they're already in captivity. Cause again, not AZA certified or whatever, but um, this one guy had like, God, like at least four or five spider monkeys as pets before he had to surrender them because they were out of control. Wouldn't you know it? Uh, they're wild animals. Um, but before that he actually uh, got their teeth removed in an, uh, in an attempt to try to like control them and make them stop biting him and drawing blood all the time. It didn't really work because they just got better at doing other stuff. But yeah, my, my experience with feeding them, giving them food, is that I would like have to approach very carefully with a bowl of like <laughs> little sandwiches that we used to make for them with like mealworms and peanut butter and stuff in them. Uh, and it's a they'd horrible use their image. little... <laughs> yeah they'd use their little tail to reach things. through and just like grab me and like try to like fucking like shake me around and constantly ripping the sandwiches out of my hands and spilling them on the ground and very very mischievous um <laughs> a common theme as we'll go on is that austin gets bullied by primates like a lot oh yeah all the time <laughs> i can detoothing a spider monkey so that it it's just sounds like people who try to declaw a cat and then expect them to stop knocking stuff off your table. Yeah. They're still going to do it. Yeah, no, it, it doesn't help because their tails are prehensile. They can just <laughs> grab you and, like, shake you around. And, it's like... almost <laughs> like they knew nothing about monkeys. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> You'd have to know very little about a monkey to get, like... Someone had a colobus monkey, which is, like... I don't know if you've ever seen those. They're, like, giant skunk-looking monkeys. They're very specific diets i don't know like even where some of these people got these animals um and then of course there's the whole concern with uh herpes that all the macaques carried that we had quite a few macaques there um i'm sorry what yeah oh yeah macaques they all oh, have herpes. herpes b yeah yeah it's okay. not just like regular herpes though herpes. it's it's herpes b which like it's it's fine for monkeys to carry but like if it gets transmitted to humans you like i think like a so like cold sore herpes or like I don't even like the it's more like a large like, kills you <laughs> <from your laughs> like large black open sore on your skin. All right, I'm sorry. I that has like a seventy yeah, percent mortality yeah, yeah, yeah. rate no, or it's something. Okay. This sometimes oh God. Is, yeah, we learn horrible things about like primates sometimes. <laughs> now you know. Thankfully, in the wild, I'm uh, cursed with knowledge. It, it's it's usually like. It gets like aggravated by stress and captivity usually, and so like most of the recorded deaths from it are from like monkey researchers who like I don't know they got a fluid in their eye from a monkey somehow, uh, and they got infected that way. But in the wild, there's not a lot of cases where even though like macaques like to bite tourists, um, usually it doesn't kill people because uh, you know that like while they're carrying it, it's not always like active. They're not shedding the virus necessarily. But yeah, no, they do all carry it, and uh, the ones that are currently on the loose in Florida are all positive, I think, for it, uh, in terms of, like, actively shedding it, so, you know? 
Another yeah. reason to avoid Florida. Many good reasons. Uh, yeah, I guess speaking of monkeys and artwork, I got dragged into this like rabbit hole reading about things like uh, the obsidian monkey vase in the uh, Aztec room in the uh, Anthropological Museum in Mexico City, which may or may not be fake. And I'm not sure if you read into that at all, but or I if you have a an opinion bit. on it. I was like, also, yeah, um, disclaimer, I know nothing about the Aztecs either. That's, that's kind yeah, of, that's you know, fair. when you are in grad school, you get deeper and deeper in the most niche topic possible. But uh, I guess I know more than the average person, but the bar is very low. Um, yeah. But I was like, I don't recognize this. Bar is um, super low for our so I looked into too, it. so it's okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, as far as I was able to read in, people are kind of still debating whether or not it was a fake, but I I don't know. I'm inclined to believe that it might have been just because of the, I think somebody said that every time they see that kind of obsidian carved, or there there were no like pieces similar to that that were made out of obsidian. They were made out of other like softer stone. Um, so they were just assuming anything like that made out of obsidian is probably a fake. But again, I, I'm just kind of retelling what they were saying. I have no idea. <laughs> Yeah, so the argument that I found, which first of all, also apparently it was uh, among 124 items stolen from the Museum of Anthropology on Christmas Eve, 1985. Yeah, um, that sounds right. Did they? <laughs> this is like insane to me that like just some people imagining like, the oceans of heist and just stole all this shit. Austin wrote yeah. about. Oh, what were you saying, Greg? Sorry. No, go ahead. Oh no, just about Ocean's Eleven in Mexico <laughs> oh, City. <okay. laughs> Austin wrote about this vase in the notes, and I was like, "There was a there was a robbery on Christmas Eve. Why is there no information about like, robbery?" In the notes? Over the fun part of this, what's happening? Yeah, um, and yeah. so I I had to look into it because it was so interesting. And apparently, a movie was made about it um, no called Museo. Drop the link. Okay, wait. It's, there's a, there was a movie on it telling a story about these two college dropouts who studied all the artifacts in that museum. And then on Christmas Eve, when all the guards were drunk, and luckily the security system wasn't working, they just they jumped right. the fence, they snuck in, and they took the most valuable items out of each of the cases. And for three years, no one knew what happened until they were caught and everything was returned. Um, and it was just two two dropouts, two dudes who who saw saw the hell of the higher education system. Well, if I ever have to drop out, drama <laughs> heist say drop out's gonna amount to anything. Yeah, <laughs> drama heist film. This sounds like it's probably funny. Maybe he just says drama and heist. <laughs> drama heist. Well, Ocean's Eleven yeah, drama heist. Funny. I don't know. Could be funny. Could, there could be. There's got to be a couple of good bits in there, right? They get the guards drunk. They didn't get the guards. The guards were doing that all on their own. It was Christmas Eve, baby. Yeah. Those dudes were working Christmas Eve. Like, they they it's deserve they deserve they deserve, deserve to get drunk on the job. Yeah, they deserve that. <laughs> Do you have what's your experience in terms of like, uh, I guess like artifacts? Um, because I I know it's pretty hard to authenticate the the veracity of some of these artifacts, especially because. Uh, to my knowledge, I mean, obviously, if it was if all the stuff was stolen in a heist, there's a market for these kind of artifacts to, I guess, private mm -hmm. collectors. Uh, do you have yeah. any, well, like, to be uh, fair? The the reason they any... failed was because there was no market for it. Because as soon as they stole everything, oh. the president got on TV the next day and said that this is the yeah, I this guess is that's the greatest, more of like a... you know dagger through the heart of the you know of Mexican you know history and tradition and culture, and. They it's couldn't sell any of it, yeah. Anymore. <laughs> yeah, when it comes to, um, I guess, kind of the, the black market, more or less, of, of artifacts, it's usually looted artifacts from sites, and they usually are, like, authentic, quote-unquote, right? But they're taken before archaeologists can, I guess, whisk them away somewhere. Mm -hmm. um, there is a big conversation about things like that when it comes to can descendant indigenous communities actually loot if they're on you know uh, occupied colonial land right mm -hmm. um 
which I'm not going to get too deep into. There's also something to be well, said for. Yeah. <laughs> there's also something to be said about, especially about like that particular vase. Is they were claiming that it was, you know, quote unquote fake because it, it would have been made by a contemporary uh, indigenous community nearby. But it's like, well, if they're still using the exact same methods um, that have been passed down through generations to make it, then is it fake or is it just contemporary? It's still an indigenous mm. piece of art. But I, again, I don't really know too much about the particular piece. Yeah. The, I think I would like to ask a bunch of Maya water questions now. They've been drilling through my head. <laughs> okay, go ahead. <laughs> right, I'm gonna go, go off on my tangent now. I gotta go off. On All right, my we can we get now. we get sideline. Sorry, we have to sideline the monkeys for a little bit. <laughs> um, so when it comes to like the, I, I don't remember exactly what word to use. These are like retention ponds that the Maya were building. Oh, aguadas. 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 Aguada. Are you, do you, yeah. like, do you find a lot of, I don't know how to say this, like, trash in them? Like, were the Maya using some of them to dump refuse? Were they, what was, like, the the purpose of them? If there's this many, like, are some of them drinking water? Are some of them irrigated? Were they kind of delineated in that way? Like, this is specifically for this. It's kept, like, cleaner if it's the drinking water. This one is for irrigation and so on. That's a good question. Yeah. So, I guess kind of. To start off, I guess I have to explain what an aguada is, right? Please. So they are usually <laughs> um, natural to an extent. They can be natural and they can be man-made and they can also be natural and then modified. And then they can be natural and then minimally modified and kind of just used as is, more of like a, a pond. Um, but usually an aguada um, was created somehow naturally as kind of like a, a depression in the land. And then a lot of the time... Um, but this also is is regional and it depends on the time period um, and kind of like the level of urbanization in the area. But they could have been paved with either um, stone or or um, clay or plaster uh, or it'd be slick stone and plaster and then uh, or clay. And that was done to kind of keep water um, seasonally in that aguada so in a lot of places at least in you know in the lacandon jungle um where it's it's a, a montane rainforest it has all these um sources of, of surface water like like rivers and lakes and it has seasonal rainfall um a wet season and a dry season so this is like to differentiate from the yucatan which doesn't have any above ground water um and i don't know what the hell the weather is up there but um you know that um, when the dry season happens in the Lacandon rainforest, uh, the water level can can drop really significantly, even if the the lakes and like water sources are uh, intercommunicated um, underground, and that also plays a, a big role in what water remains like during the dry season. So the paving was done to basically keep a year round source of water um, and collect what little rain was was still coming, and um, they're usually found either in, well, you know, I guess it varies. They're found in city centers. And um, in the case of where I work, uh, I work at the the site of Noku. And there's an aguada. Well, there's what we think. I have, that's what my dissertation research is on, whether or not this is an aguada or if this is a cenote. So that would have to do with its geology. Um, but we do have like this very circular kind of body of water that we refer to as an aguada that's in um, the city center. And then there's a, a series of them out in, in the milpas or the, the farming fields, um, which are used as milpas now and, and were also used as milpas um, thousands of years ago. And they had a lot of purposes. So they were used as, as sources of drinking water. They were used as sources of water for farming or for uh, agroforestry was done in this particular area. So instead of just like farming that we think of nowadays it was kind of done in conjunction with the health of the forest um and it didn't just chop everything down necessarily in the same way so it was used for irrigation in a way they may have been connected in some way to a canal system um i forgot what the question was um so did I. A lot you, answered a, you answered a bunch of things um yeah, yeah. but did they have um, some like i don't know if the water irrigation it. water that kind of <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. Where they kind of delineate, or can we even? Tell? I know stuff has been found in Aguadas. I have okay. yet to, to excavate the one that I work on, but I do know that, um, like water jugs. I, I think again, don't. Okay. I'm pretty sure water jugs. There's stuff found in, in there. It, so yeah, <laughs> there's stuff in there. There's stuff in there. Um, um where the where the like I know the at like I know the Aztecs, and a lot of uh, like things between the Aztecs and the Maya. A lot of them were big canal builders. 
Mexico is littered with rivers that are not good for boats. Um, so, like, were the Maya very, very big in on building canals? And is that just like a result of like a lack of draft animals? And that's how things were moved around between population centers? And how did those canals kind of differ, I guess you could say, from like the canals in Mexico City? The the canals, as, as far as I know, you know, from what I've read about, uh, trade and, and travel was usually done over rivers. Um, so the canals were usually contained within uh, a polity. So they would be used for things like um, you were getting crops, you know, and getting water essentially from one place to another. Um, right now at the site that I work at, I'm, I'm, you know, looking at, you know, LIDAR maps and kind of hypothesizing, you know, that this was an, ex they were extending the natural um, kind of channels from, from water features in the area through the city center. And that's kind of the function of, of those canals. They weren't ever, uh, as far as I know, they weren't ever like river sized to the point where that you can travel down them or anything like that. Okay. I know that in, in Palenque, for example, there's one of the most like beautiful examples of Maya water management and, and canals in that there are like these very river-like canals that are, are built up with stone walls. And it does connect to, there is a river, um, the river Tuliha runs through it and um and a series of waterfalls and um leading you know in the direction of the site or within the site and they all connect they they become kind of a system so it's kind of to answer your earlier question like whether there's delineation between these water features as far as as i'm you know in the research that i'm doing kind of a big argument i make is that there isn't a delineation in a lot of water management research and it's things change over time and people kind of change what they're what they're saying about it as far as i'm concerned that i you know their role straddles kind of this liminal space between natural and unnatural um or natural and even supernatural so they yeah and they also they did a lot of things they contain multitudes did the um <laughs> excuse the pun but did the fluid fluidity of the purpose for each of these water features did that what how did that affect the in the mayas and their relationship to that water if, if things aren't being like, like, how does, how do they think about water? How do they think about their access to water? Like, can kids go play in the canal type of thing? You know, what does that kind of non-delineation leave them looking like, leave the, the that interaction looking like on a day-to-day -day basis? That is a really good question. <laughs> um, I'll let you know when I finish the presentation. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> um kind of the way that i've been thinking through it though is is you know i kind of argue that there is a, a lot of like scholars of, of maya water um have kind of go back and forth between whether there is you know certain bodies of water that have a f just a functional use some that have just like a, a sacred use and and you know there are some that serve both um kind of like looking through everything from kind of an indigenous studies perspective, there is, they kind of can be all true simultaneously. So water bodies are all representative of like the sacred, like primordial waters that, that humanity came from. Sorry in advance if you heard my dog bark. Okay. okay. Anyway, the world emerged from water that's part of the you know the creation story of the maya that you also read about in the popol vu so from the the primordial waters came the earth and then from the earth came you know the first mountain and from the mountain then came trees and animals and then eventually like the you know several um creations of that eventually lead up to people mm -hmm. and water just played a really important role in the landscape and ideas of, of land and and water and kind of sacred landscape are really intertwined and it has a lot to do with how people built their cities um and how like they lived their daily lives and you know there's certain you know scholars will specialize in like these really niche components you know um i have colleagues who who kind of research kind of like elite water control over um like populations i so i don't really know too much about that <laughs> but um things like that there's a lot of different things that you can get into about it gotcha and i also i had this not as a oh, oh. i i had this really quick question for you earlier when you're talking about the uh creation of the monkeys this myth of making out of mud out of mud out of out of wood what are I, I don't know if you can answer this this might be too simply it's maybe too basic of a question 
but what are like the basic elements in Maya spiritual and Maya religion? Because like you know, like the the earth, wind, air, water, fire. It's not what we consider the elements isn't universal, right? Like in Hinduism, like space is an element. Is there is right. there like a, a list of elements in the in the in the religion? That's a really good question. I don't know enough to speak too much on it. All I can really pull off the top of my head is that the directions play a really important role. I don't know about elements necessarily, uh -huh. um, but I do know that the directions is um, interesting. There is part of my big old um, <laughs> manifesto uh, is that <laughs> I don't think that that Maya area archaeologists or or any archaeologist that works in the Mexico and Central America kind of draw enough from uh, indigenous studies of, of North America because people forget that Mexico is part of mm -hmm. North America. Um, and like Native American studies. So, you know, I'll, I'll read about my archeologist talking about the Mesoamerican cross symbol and how it's all oh, this, and it's a, these directions associated with these colors. And I'm like, that's the medicine wheel, homie. Mm -hmm. Like go to a powwow sometime. It's the same thing. <laughs> I mean, they're not identical, but they share a lot of similarities. And, you know, there was trade and communication and interaction between people up here and down there. So it makes sense. Um, but I do know that, yeah, directions. Are important wind mm. is important water um the sun things like that gotcha. that's a very broad general yeah. question because the answer yeah that's ex that's exactly why I, I felt kind of bad <laughs> asking it because like yeah. uh, you could <laughs> ask you could ask an expert in a different yeah. field and you get a different <laughs> answer every time yeah okay. and i've got a i've got a rapid fire one for you because i know every historian of of civilizations that okay. have come and gone at its peak what do you think the population of the maya area was how many people a do you lot of think fucking people. that they were able to support because you know millions? by the time of Spanish I, attacks, i'm not enough look i got dyscalculia so but i'm pretty sure like million i don't know i do know that um the uh estimated population size of palenque i think was like twenty thousand people okay. i think but it was considered a small city Okay. Um, okay. Because I know, but I also I don't know if that's concept. outdated information, because um, like population estimates are are relative and they change a lot, and people yeah. can make arguments for different things. Um, but but that would, and then I think that there's a similar kind of estimate for population size at the site that I work at, which is a much okay. less monumental. It's monumental, but it's not nearly as grand as Palenque, and it's also not a classic period site. So it was like an early pre-classic kind of. Um, dawn of maya urbanization era site and it had a really large population the thing is that uh, people lived everywhere so yeah. like the problem with maps in academia is that like a huge problem with it is that you see these points on a map of these maya cities and it doesn't first let you see kind of the scale of how big the city was because it's a dot mm -hmm. and then you just see you know areas where there was nothing but you know there was something there. There were people um, there, so, yeah. Yeah, so I think it's, I, you know, in my opinion, it's really safe to assume that people lived everywhere. Millions. Was your site, the site that you work at, was it, I, I don't want to say abandoned, because I don't know, I don't really know if that's the right term. Was it already in decline by the time of a city like Palenque? Like, was it already, had it kind of become more of a an exurb, like a very tiny town with this monumental architecture by the time of a, post-classical city yeah that's kind of what my dissertation is trying to look at because um my, the area that i work in is really interesting in that it had a lot of these these monumental sites built in the pre-classic period and then we don't see anything built during the classic period which doesn't necessarily people mean that people didn't live there during the classic period it just means that nothing was built and you know if the elite move somewhere else that's one thing. Usually in cases of where you talk about, you know, quote, unquote, like abandonment, um, it's just referring to the fact that the elite no longer live there and they're no longer building things. But commoners have remained uh, for time immemorial and have always been there. Yeah. And then, I mean, they're building a building out of wood. It's not going to be there. Yeah. And so, so like ephemeral architecture, there's lots of for the most part, like the, the houses that were built in the area that I work in, while there are lots of stone platforms, like there's hundreds and hundreds just that we've been able to like map and, and understand, um, would have had, there are, the houses would have been built out of wooden thatch mm -hmm. and plaster. So those types of things are kind of hard to find. But as far as, as we think, I guess, I don't know. I'm pretty sure people, 
I'd like to think that people still remained there. There's been kind of discussions based on paleoclimatic data about whether there were maybe climate refugees, more or less, um, people moving from one place to another based on access to water or other resources. So right now, that's kind of what my dissertation seems to be leaning towards looking at is is kind of the role of the water management in this area and whether or not that played a role in people may or may not be like moving away from Noku at the dawn of the, the classic period because you know Palenque was built around there you know had its major occupation time during the classic period and then I don't work at Palenque so I don't know how else yeah. like when it stopped being occupied um but I do know that in the post classic um is when buildings start being built again um down by you know in Noku which is pretty close to Palenque I can't pull the kilometers off the top if of my I'm, head, but if I'm not, I'm not crazy, right? Because by the time the Spanish got to Mexico, the Maya had already stopped building new things, right? Or was it right up until that moment where the Maya the the same like level of vibrance, you could say, I guess, like they were building monumental architecture. There's a lot of debate around that. Um, that's where kind of that whole big like oh the the, the collapse of the maya mm -hmm. is still something that people are having like vicious arguments about in conferences nowadays um more or less and i love anthropology arguments they're so <laughs> passive aggressive that you don't even realize they're having an argument <laughs> but um yeah. yeah so people still kind of debate that whether there was and and now that there are a lot of scholars coming out and pushing back against the idea of abandonment and collapse and how they're pretty inherently colonialist and um also erase like commoners i guess mm -hmm. the the truthful answer is i have no idea okay. um and then there were also pockets of populations that were not um affected directly by like the spanish invasion or at least in the same way and there were refugees yeah okay <laughs> One more, I got one more for you. Cause you yeah, mentioned trade, you mentioned time, trade with, North, with like more, like further up in North America with native tribes that aren't necessarily the Aztec. Mm -hmm. um, and I know that you work at a site that's inland, but I do. what were the, what, what was, were the Mayans seafaring at all? Did they have any ability? I mean, even if it's like following the coastline in a very small boat, were were I, any Mesoamerican cultures doing that? Uh I I want to say yes, but that's also I think that's a blind spot of my niche <laughs> expertise. Um, but I've heard that I've heard that um, I mean, I don't know, you canoe on a on a a river, yeah. and I'm pretty sure that that yeah, following the coast was a thing. I know that there was interaction um, between people like further up um, on the continent. I guess how is kind of escaping my knowledge, but I'd like to say yes. I think yeah. so. I always think white people uh, underestimate brown people, so I'm inclined I mean, to be I like, agree. Because, yeah. yeah, I mean, I know we, <laughs> they've found, I don't know how definitive, but I, I do believe that artifacts from Mexico have been found, like, in Cuba. So, like, you can assume that there's some level of ocean-going ability. That is not a close-by thing to do in a canoe. Yeah, and then I think I read some more about Florida, but I'm I don't know. I don't remember what I was reading. <laughs> and also, I guess now that I'm a big believer in alternate explanations to the Bering Strait theory that I, you know, I believe mm -hmm. indigenous oral history that says that people came down in boats um before, you know, the current estimates. So I I yeah, I think so. every day I read more and more about Polynesian seafarers. Yeah. You know, I just saw something very recently where they think that they're fine. They found human remains in California that are much, much older than the Bering, than like walking over the Bering Land Bridge would allow for. And I mean, just that looking, right. I mean, look, you look at the <laughs> level of civilizational development, not necessarily like you could maybe forgive Mexico, but like all the way down in southern South America. You can't say that they, like, people went from hunter-gatherers to building a place, like, I, I can't name an Inca site now, but building anything the Inca built, like, My that people quickly, people. having just got there well, with a supposedly very small <laughs> population. Sorry, not so well-actually. No, 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 well-actually. <laughs> Please, well-actually. Well <laughs> <laughs> um, 
the Inca came about later on, kind of like the Aztecs. So, like, I know, like, Machu Picchu was built in, like, the 1400s or something like that. So, so. there were uh, older, like, the Moche were older. Yeah, um, they're precursors. Tiwanaku, that's what I was thinking about. Tiwanaku, yeah. That's the extent of my knowledge yeah. of South America. I took, like, one <laughs> class. Um, <laughs> and that was it. Like, I know there's old, there's older, like, monumental civilizations, but the thought, my thought being is... If people only got to North America 20,000 years ago, they did a hell of a job getting to where they got that quickly when the rest of the world took an additional yeah. 30,000 years to get to that level. I'm, I'm, <laughs> I don't know enough about it to dispute it, but that doesn't sound right, but it's the opposite. I don't know enough about it to argue for it, but that sounds right. <laughs> yeah. Okay. That's where bioarchaeology <laughs> would come in. Um, I tend to be very <laughs> skeptical uh, of bioanthropology and bio art. No offense, <laughs> in general. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that's but that's right. one area where it can get pretty cool. And I know that like dating um, human remains that are found can get kind of complicated because yeah. people argue whether are you you know is the radiocarbon dating dating like the rock around it or is it the bone or like is it just intrusion like what's happening what are you actually dating? Yeah. Um, and but yeah, I know that you know I feel like that date just keeps getting pushed further and further back, and then it's like you know. Native people who have been telling, you know, generational stories about like people coming over all yeah. this long ago, or like we told you this like a while ago. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> I also did some pretty interesting reading recently about like you when you mentioned the hero twins. Like that's a very common myth around the world, but it, it can be kind of they they, they have done some ba there's some basic tracing that can be done back towards Central Asia leading to the Americas. Which is, I find that very fascinating because you can almost say, okay, well, there's your tracking. But those those myths are much older than that date that they're giving still. That is really interesting. Yeah, stuff like that is fascinating to me. Not in the, not in the, I think that <laughs> there's a lot, you know, there's lots of ways people, <laughs> people get <laughs> that I won't name kind of twist that stuff. But I do think that if you kind of approach it ethically that stuff is really yes. interesting too yeah. um and things about like hero it almost at that point becomes a shared kind of humanistic way mm -hmm. of knowing the world that's really interesting um there's like the idea of uh uh the world being on the back of a turtle that's shared in the americas to to other parts of the world is really interesting obviously not identically but it's still like a, it's weird that it happened twice kind of yeah yeah <laughs> um that's yeah. super cool. Um, and there's also, uh, there's a, a Danishoni god of thunder that has a hammer. Um, so like the, the, Ooh, the Iroquois interesting. Um, have, have like a, a sacred being who, who wields a, and um, I feel like in Mesoamerica, there are also like rain deities who, who wield a, a, a weapon. And and in some it's like an axe, and it's in some it's a hammer. So do I think that that means there was ancient communication between the fucking Norse and the, yeah. no? But I do think it's a really interesting shared yeah, um, shared commonality kind of way of understanding thunder, right? Um, that's super cool. Yeah. Also, the root word for water is almost the same yeah. in like well over fifty percent of the entire world's languages. Which really? I've always found interesting, like oh. the the sound for water. Oh, it's mostly English where it's we're wrong, but like in Spanish, like wait, agua. what is it? Uh, it's ow, like the agua, like it's that sound is like the root of water in like most languages. That is cool. Yeah, in Mayan, it's or at least in Yucatecan, uh, it's ha, it's h a with a little yeah. glottal ha. Uh huh. Yeah. So, um, I uh, forgot what I was uh, Austin, yeah, Austin's in top of the bit to get back <laughs> right. to the podcast. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> podcast. <laughs> um, but I guess, uh, I'll start reading my notes and it'll come to me. So, uh, this guy, Eugene, Eugene Boban, Boban, I don't know, it's some French guy. Uh, he sold part of his collection to the Smithsonian, uh, and I think the obsidian monkey vase was in it, and oh, I'm sure he a got couple of known it. fakes were in that, and there's like the, one theory is that there were fakes produced in the 19th and early 20th centuries that uh, have a primitive look because sort of, you know, colonial uh, white archaeological collectors just sort of associated crudeness and like simpleness with more ancient art from indigenous people. I think that's like a definitely a possible theory, but there's also a lot of interesting stuff to go into about uh, what you were mentioning earlier about like 
you know, is it really, like, why is it that that guy can sort of, like, he donates his collection to the museum, right? Now it's, like, a part of the archaeological record, but it's illegal for anyone else to do, like, looting, for example, even if they are, like, indigenous. Um, and, you know, you can't really just dig for artifacts wherever you want. It needs to be on private land, obviously. And, you know, if someone just came with, like, an artifact, you know, that's going to be suspicious. But uh, just the ways that we, we classify valid artifacts is very interesting. Because, like, even if it was not created as far back as, you know, the museum would have liked it to be, if it was still created by an indigenous person in the area, would it not still be, like, a part of the archaeological record? You know, like, what are they trying to get from this? Are they trying to construct some sort of, you know, mythological, like, state of being that these uh, artifacts exist well, in, yeah. I guess. Okay, so the one thing I do know about the Aztecs is that they played a big, and the Maya to an extent, play a huge role in um, the kind of creation of Mexican nationalism. And that's mm -hmm. a whole other topic altogether. But it's like, it's big in that the Mexican yeah. colonial government made a big deal about instead of outright rejecting indigeneity they decided that we're instead going to co-opt all of it and we're going to collectively make the entire population of mexico forget that native people are still around and instead relegate them to to the past and that all of you are descendants of native people but they ain't no more now which yeah. obviously isn't true so so the aztecs and like primarily the Aztecs and the Maya. Obviously, there were there were hundreds of cultures, um, probably more than that. But like you know, big monumental like building people were throughout the area. But you know, the Aztecs and the Maya and and the Toltecs to an extent, um, who have a relationship with a, kind of an almost ancestral relationship with the Aztecs. I don't know more about that though. Um, are co-opted to become kind of like this part of of they're co-opted and they're kind of blended together in a blender to become this kind of awful conglomerated past that everybody can kind of that the mexican government can then claim as its own and artifacts and and kind of delineation of time is a big part of that so when they mark the end of the pre or the post-classic period and begin the historic period um and arguments around that is is part of it as far as the maya is concerned and then um yeah the idea of what what makes an artifact what makes it archaeological and what makes it quote unquote historic goes it, i think that that plays a big part in it yeah definitely i i think also like museums sort of rhetorically at least in a like colonial anthropological sense of uh, sort of rhetorically uh, relegate certain uh, indigenous societies to the past by presenting them in a museum context because you go to a museum it's you, you're like learning about all oh, the the past of human civilization you know rhetorically that that sort of relegates them to the past i think and that is a function of colonialism definitely maybe. yeah now I was, I was just at the smithsonian and it's very apparent smithsonian that like they can no the, the the contradiction of that colonial identity making is no longer as tenable. We all know basically now. So mm -hmm. they just have artifacts, and you know they'll tell you how it came into the possession of the museum. But at the end, there's always like a little disclaimer. Yeah, that person's still just out there. We it belongs to them. Or we're not returning it. Yep. Yeah. 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 There's a, a fun story about um uh the museum in Mexico City too that I that I know of. Um and it has to do with the origin of like the the Aztec calendar stone. It's kind of colloquially known. Like people call it the sunstone or the calendar stone, but it's the big round thing that people always call the Maya calendar, but it's not. Um and <laughs> oh. when that was uncovered <laughs> um in C2 in in the big plaza in the in CDMX. It was uncovered with something else. I'm pretty sure it was Coatlicue, the big statue of the snake woman. And they uncovered both. And they were like, okay, well, that's terrifying. But that, now that's cool. And so they like hung it up on the side of the building, the the Aztec calendar stone, um, and decided like this is going to become like like iconic of, of this kind of created identity we're going for, this nationalist identity. Um, but we're going to, re they reburied Coatlicue. Because they were like, okay, no. Not that mm -hmm. though. Is That's it still in the ground? 
No, it was uncovered oh. again. I don't know the dates. Um, and okay. <laughs> she's she's in the she's somewhere in a museum where she's not supposed to be. But I'm pretty sure it was Quatli Gray. Um, yeah. or another. No, I think it's her. So you, you got uncovered yeah. like a six foot snake woman. And you're like, all right, <laughs> bad example. Back in. Um, and then <laughs> bury her again. <laughs> That's yeah. I don't know. Yeah, I always found that interesting. Like especially, especially I guess the Aztecs because it became the colonial center as well. It became the point of power projection for Spain. That I don't think a lot of people learn is just like for decades after Spanish contact, the Aztec Empire continued to exist as a client state. It was not. It was not yeah. like part of the crown of Spain. It was its own polity still and it's is it's like is that what the mexican government i guess you could say especially in its very early colonial phase is that what they're claiming their descendancy from is it are they the colony of mexico or are they they're saying we are that legal successor we're the aztec empire it's like a it's a combination so it really does rely on conquest the idea that that the Aztecs and other, you know, these really like huge, powerful cultures were conquered by Spain um, and then absorbed, and uh, that they conveniently also this erases kind of like Afro Mexican people too. So it's like well, yeah. it's sometimes sometimes people remember to include it in the big horrible national identity that we are all just mixed descendants we are the the cosmic race you know yeah. of of spanish and indigenous and um free black people and we're perfect as a result which like most people are on the level and then they're like okay well like that's not really a thing but it was a yeah. it played a big role in propaganda yeah. like state sanctioned propaganda um and kind of justifying things that the mexican government did and and continues to do nowadays you know it's it's like you were saying like they now everybody knows so they're kind of shifting the narrative and they're kind of it's like this level of yeah kind of performatively acknowledging this history but then not really swerving too much in the is there a mexican nancy playing? pelosi wearing a dashiki equivalent <laughs> like, <laughs> taking a meal inside the capitol building Jesus in mexico Christ. City. that's basically the president <laughs> I'm gonna get on all this now. <laughs> yeah. Don't get yourself shut out uh, going back. Yeah. Oh, I know. Did you know that it is illegal for for actually? I I don't know if this has changed, but it's um illegal in Mexico for foreigners to participate in acts of like political, like activism. Um, Isn't that illegal here? Uh huh. Is it? Probably. I think it is. Probably. Yeah, I think they'll try is you it? under the Espionage Act or something. Might be. Shout out McCarthyism. Really? I don't know that. So yeah, um, would you say that this is, uh, I guess like this uh, identity building based on artifacts that people do and do not want. I remember, I, I wish I could pin down who specifically it was, but there was like a group of indigenous people, uh, I feel like it was the Navajo, but maybe not, um, who like sort of helped in early archaeological expeditions to dig up artifacts and like give them to uh, museums as sort of like paid laborers because they didn't really place the same value on those particular artifacts that the anthropologists did. Um, and I, I believe there's even some, uh, I, I don't know if this is just like one specific niche case where like um, some people like don't want like certain artifacts returned to them because, you know, they, they were taken from like funeral sites and it's like, you know, handling stuff from funeral sites is frowned upon generally. Um, I forgot where I was going with this, but <laughs> I don't, do you have any do you have any thoughts on sort of the the way that people like choose which artifacts are like how Europeans versus indigenous people choose what artifacts are made? Stuff like that definitely changes over time. I do know like an example. Um, yeah. uh, there was cases of like Anishinaabe people kind of giving certain objects to museums for safekeeping, and they were given on a loan, and the idea that they weren't permanently supposed mm. to be there um and that kind of gets into you know museum abuse of native communities and stuff um but yeah there were cases like and yeah. it's always going to be like case by case like there are some families who like converted to christianity and they didn't want a particular thing anymore because it was yeah. associated with uh ceremony and that would be given to the museum and then like a generation later they're like okay well th grandma was 
on some stuff. We want that it's back, always please. Grandma. And, it's always um, grandma. Yeah, yeah. And, <laughs> it's and then now with mom. Nagpra too, it's like for the most part, I, I guess I don't know any specific. I can't think of any cases where people wouldn't want funerary objects back, but I know that there was like at a certain time. Yeah, I, that could have been just something that right, someone. I have one more question that I'm going <laughs> to ask and let you answer, and then I'll go, and you guys can go as long as you want. So I my, and I'm gonna. I hate to make you use like Mexico City as an example of that, but I know that there weren't very many major Maya sites still being like, still acting as I guess a, a metropole when the Spanish arrived. They were much. Let's assume they're smaller at this point. We have descriptions from the Spanish uh, describing you know Tenochtitlan as this monumental, beautiful, well kept city. What is the reasoning? Because colonialism is in its very earliest stages here, at least in the European sense, to destroy that, like to completely knock it down. Whereas how many cultures have conquered Rome and they didn't knock down the Colosseum per se. What was the reasoning, if there is a written reason for the city to not continue to look the way it did? I think that has to do with, yeah, conquest and power. So... It was a big, well-recorded thing all throughout Mexico in the Maya area, especially too, that the Spanish would build their own, they would build churches on top mm -hmm. of indigenous sacred sites, and then they would build their own cities on top of indigenous cities. So I think it has a lot to do with um, kind of how places like Rome and other big monumental, like historical and archaeological sites kind of play, like th these are places that, that Europeans have known about, and they play a role in their own origin stories. So the act of taking that city on its own um, becomes, that's its own form of conquest, whereas in like the new world, you see building on top of it is, is how it kind of, because they don't have any connection to these places, like how they would with places like Rome. And, but there's also, you know, in other parts of the world, I do know that there's, there's instances of, when it comes to religion, there's a long history of like, um, building um, religious temples on top of the previous like community's religious place, and that yeah. was something that they continued definitely in in Mexico. Yeah, and uh, yeah, I don't know if Greg has to head out, but I do. I, I do. I, have, I guess. Um, but yeah. before I go, thank you so much for coming on. Thank you so much for answering yeah. all of thank the questions all that of I questions. threw at you. <laughs> yeah, no problem. You had um, <laughs> kept me busy. <laughs> and um, <laughs> sorry. I will go now. Bye bye. <laughs> bye. <laughs> yeah. Bye, bye, Greg. All right. We'll we'll wrap up here. But I I, I also want to share my thoughts because I'm I'm selfish. I need to I need to chime in on everything. <laughs> but uh, I I feel like also part of it might be uh, I, I mean I guess I'm not sure ex entirely on like when this specifically emerged in the context of colonialism. But like there was like the sense that Europeans sort of like defined humanity the state of being a human, like, around European universal ideas and necessarily started seeing uh, indigenous people from, like, other places as not human, or they weren't afforded, like, this, like the definition of humanity. And so, like, a lot of things that they would treat other humans with were not necessarily afforded to them because they didn't fit their preconceived definition of humanity and, you know, weren't thought of as human. But I'm not entirely sure if that's the case here but it's something i've heard of I it guess. is yeah it's totally a thing there is um the first thing that popped in my head is there in chiapas there's this city called san cristobal de las casas and it's beautiful it's like mexican seattle um it has pine trees everywhere and it never gets higher than 70 degrees but um this is mm -hmm. a, a big like beautiful kind of uh colonial era city so it has the the colorful buildings and everything of um that time period. And it's also where there's a lot of contemporary Maya communities, um, like Celtal and Sotzil, Maya peoples still live there. And historically, you know, there are, are very skinny little sidewalks in this city. And um, two people can't walk on the sidewalk at the same time in a lot of these places. Um, not all of them, but like the older parts of the city. And the reasoning for that from what I know kind of from being told, I guess I'm pretty sure I fact checked. <laughs> this is something that I've been told from, from living there for, for a very short period of time. And that, um, indigenous people were expected to get off the sidewalk and walk in the street. 
when a white person walked mm-hmm. by. So that's like one very you know small like drop in the giant bucket of racism and anti-indigenous like colonialism that's been going on and in, in like area, evidence of like infrastructure sure. so racism almost yeah. you know just like it's, it's yes they, they wiped yeah. everything and rebuilt yeah. a, a a city a place where they are dominant yeah and even to yeah. um it's so like the community that i work with the lacando and maya um they have this kind of reputation as being the unconquered quote-unquote maya um because their relationship with colonialism is very kind of fundamentally different from other maya ethnic groups in the area because they remained uh in in like the least amount of contact with white people as long as they could manage um so while there was like some trading with loggers and stuff it wasn't until in like the public sense to like european descendant populations in like the the late 1700s and they kind of became a folk tale and and that um kind of like subjugated indigenous people and and like spaniards alike would be like oh well you know it's like the the savage indians of the jungle like don't run off kids or you're they're gonna eat you and in 1946 yeah, yeah so like the 1940s um the lacandon showed a group of like European explorers where the ruins of Bonampak were, which have some of the most beautiful um, examples of Maya muralism in the area. And yeah, so they were like, oh, well, we discovered this uh, this building. And also we discovered uh, this group of, this tribe of Mayans living in the jungle, <laughs> uh, which like people yeah, have known geez. that the Lacandon have been in there and they just left them alone and they just traded sometimes with loggers and stuff like that for the past, you know, like 200 years prior to that. And they just minded their business. And then now, you know, they're like, we discovered this uncontacted like tribe of Indians in the jungle. And a lot of dehumanization kind of happened as a result for sure. Yeah. Like the, the way that they <laughs> were written about, um, it's, I mean, because it's not a competition, like the way that the Lock and Doan were treated by the government uh, was very different from how like other communities who had been subjugated um, for, for hundreds of years before that were, but it was like, it was messed up in a different way. And yeah. that kind of stuff was pretty pervasive. I think I yeah. lost the plot a little on that question, but yeah. <laughs> no, no, I, this is all interesting. I like to hear about it. Um. I do have my one last little question because it just randomly popped into my head, and you know, <laughs> I have no idea how much you know about this. But Chandran, do you have any? Uh, I, don't ha- final I don't have any thoughts now. Not anymore. <laughs> <laughs> Not anymore. I do have something I have no thoughts um, <laughs> that I totally forgot about until right now. Um, what's re- what? Oh, yeah. Probably this is relevant. <laughs> um, at um, the lake system that I work at, it's called Lake Metzabog, and there is a. Mm-hmm like set of cliff paintings that were, were done in the post-classic period. So that would have been, uh, I think there's no exact dating on that as far as I know, but it would have been between like the, you know, 900 AD and the 1500s. Um, but they're red ochre cliff paintings and they, they show a lot of different things. There's like seated human figures, um, standing figures, I think a dog and notably uh, a howler monkey. And that howler monkey nice. uh, icon, yeah, it. <laughs> it is actually kind of um, sort of a, a logo now of like, so the, the Metzabok area, uh, along with its nearby like sister town, Naha, are protected natural areas. And then within um, a UNESCO protected biosphere. So these particular little, the little logo of the area, like the Metzabok um, protection area is this howler monkey. So oh, it's super cool. <laughs> nice. Yeah. All right. So my last question was, what was what was that thing with the with the mummies, the the alien corpses? Oh God, you know, I, what was that about? I like I, all of that happened. I think when I was in the field in Mexico, oh. and yeah, because like it was like I was acknowledging it, but like nothing was like I was like, what what is this? I still <laughs> like, have, have no idea, idea what, that was about? what that was about. <laughs> okay yeah i was I like man that. i got a lot going <laughs> yes. on i don't need aliens yet right now i'll give me a minute yeah um <laughs> i don't even want to know yeah i just wanted to <laughs> run that by you because i was like what the fuck was that about <laughs> uh, uh, but yeah all right well yeah thank you so much yeah, for coming course. on this was uh, yeah i, I was learned so a lot and talking to you heard a lot of interesting stuff i think it was great talking to you guys your questions yeah. were great 
Yeah, Greg had those Even ready to go. <laughs> I hope I mostly stayed on topic. I guess we did diverge from monkeys a few times. No, it's our mm-hmm. audience. They love the tangents. Okay, cool. <laughs> They're enough. addicted to so the we don't have, that's what, We it. did that on purpose so we don't have to stay on topic because we're so bad at it. No, it worked out for me because I have a very <laughs> limited um, scope of monkeys in general. Mm-hmm. I have like... Yeah, that's all right. I mean, we just use the monkeys as a platform to talk about other interesting stuff anyway. As one the time, does. So. <laughs> no, they're monkeys. They do the same thing over yeah. and over again. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You can only talk about so many monkeys. <laughs> but yeah, uh, thank you so much for coming on. And uh, yeah. I guess we'll go ahead and sign off. This was episode 48. Make sure you subscribe to our Patreon if you're listening out there, mm-hmm. if you haven't already, where we need to... Get back to 450 a month because some of you <laughs> <laughs> only only joined for that one episode. I, I saw that happen. Anyways, so yeah, thank you again for coming on, and we'll see everyone next time. Bye-bye. Goodbye. Goodbye. I, I, I may be a white boy, but I'm not stupid. <laughs>